Father, we have been seeking your face this morning so far. It is a face that looks at us and smiles and welcomes us into your presence. And God, as we have our heads bowed now, I pray that you'd lift them up. Whether they're bowed just because of prayer or whether they're bowed because we've come in here wounded and limping, I pray that you would lift our faces to meet yours, that we would see you in new and fresh ways, and we would know what it means to follow Jesus with everything we have and everything we are. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, feel free to grab a seat. Well, again, I'm, I'm excited. I'm so glad that you're all here. And I don't know if you knew this, but this is our last week in the book of Genesis. I think I only had one kid when we started, and uh, my youngest kid's almost seven. So I am thrilled uh, to be in this book. It really, actually, I got a little choked up. I can get choked up about anything, but I was thinking about, man, the journey we've been on. Genesis is one of those books that you've probably read before, at least know some of the main stories. And I hope that uh, what's true for me has been true for you, is I've seen these stories in just a new and fresh way. We've got to see God revealing who he is through what he's done in real human history. And if you follow along in our Prepare for Sundays, they've by and large been right, but this week I made it completely wrong. I had said to focus your attention on chapters 49 and 50, and that was totally the plan until I read through chapter 48 one more time and God grabbed me. And so he said, you know, you're going to have to be, it wasn't mainly a lie, but I was a little incorrect. We're going to spend the balance of our time this morning mostly in chapter 48 because it just grabbed me by the lapels and I couldn't stop staring at it. And so I say all that, and actually we're going to look at like three verses in chapter 47 too. So if you read the prepare for Sunday email, just ignore it in the past. Sorry about that. But I think it's going to be worth our time because as we finish up, we're going to see God kind of close up this chapter of the scriptures for us and point us towards what he's doing in the future. So as we look at chapter 48, mostly this morning, we're going to see at least three things. We're going to see a future-oriented death. We're going to see a gracious adoption. And we're going to see a crisscrossed blessing. Yet as we look at 48, future-oriented death, gracious adoption, crisscrossed blessing. I think we have... Bibles ready to hand out. So again, um, it's, we're going to be at chapter 48. If you want a Bible to look at in front of you, raise your hand. We have some ushers ready to hand them out. The words will also be on the screen or always in your phone. Um, if you need one, raise your hand, but we'll be in the very end of chapter 47 to start, mostly in 48. Here we go. Genesis chapter 47, verse 29. It says, when the time drew near for Israel, which was another name for Jacob, to die, he called for his son Joseph and said to him, If I have found favor in your eyes, put your hand under my thigh and promise that you will show me kindness and faithfulness. Do not bury me in Egypt, but when I rest with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt and bury me where they are buried. I will do as you say, he said. Swear to me, he said. Then Joseph swore to him, and Israel worshipped and leaned as he leaned on top of his staff. Now right out of the gates... I think these verses give us room for incredible, immense gratitude. There's a, you know, a couple big events uh, happening, but at that time, it was customary when you made agreements to make them in a particular way. And I think as we read about how they did that back then, that we can have incredible gratitude that some wise person invented the handshake rather than the upper thigh grab. <laughs> to make an agreement. You see, right out of the gates, he's trying to promise something incredible. And how did they do it? He says, put your hand under my thigh and promise me that you will show me kindness. You could just imagine down the road, somebody reading about that and saying, when they're about to make a big agreement and someone is kind of going to get way up in their business. They said, I'm going to go on a limb here, buddy. Let's try it a different way. What if we just, I don't know, touch hands instead of you grabbing me way up there? I don't know, we can even grab or shake them up and down, but let's not do the upper thigh grab. But in that time, that was how important agreements were made. So right out of the, you know, I think we actually see this trace all the way into the New Testament. You see in James 5.12, there's a verse that says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. And I think that's just a nod back to don't grab my upper thigh. I don't even want you shaking my hand most of the time. Just be a person of your word. But that's not the main thing that we can have some gratitude for here. Because see, we see some other stuff. 
what I think is the main point of these verses is we see a future-oriented death. You see, Joseph is there. He's the one taking care of the funeral and burial arrangements for his father, Jacob. But it was normally the eldest son's responsibility. But we know God has been flipping the script left and right, and that this younger, not, not the youngest, Benjamin was the youngest, but this very younger son, Joseph, was the most esteemed and blessed, and he was the one ensuring where Jacob would be buried. And in his death, he is looking forward to the promises of God. He said God had promised us that we would inherit a land, not this land where we are, but this beautiful promised land, and that's where I want to be buried. He's not trying to be fussy. What he is trying to do is, even in his death, mark his, his confidence in the promises of God that he won't die and remain where he is. He will die and be buried where God promised his people would inherit the land. See, I think this is an incredible picture of what discipleship looks like. One of the spiritual writers I've read uh, uh, quite a bit of in the last couple of years is a man named Ronald Rollheiser, and he talks about three levels of discipleship. I've mentioned them before, but I'll mention them again today. The first level that Rollheiser says is essential discipleship, and he describes it as the struggle to get our lives together. Now, this might feel like quite a bit of discipleship to you and to me. This is that phase of your discipleship in Christ when you are trying to get rid of those big bulk sins in your life, those things that really just slow you down and gobble up your attention and feel like they separate you from God and what he's trying to do through you. And so you're just trying to get your life together. So that's not just not doing some stuff, but that's also the phase of life where you're trying to put together a set of good disciplines and good habits, reading the scriptures, praying regularly, serving the poor. And you are just doing your best, and it's a struggle. It's a struggle to get your lives together. But Rollheiser knows that that's not where we are supposed to stay. See, we are supposed to get our lives together in this essential discipleship so that we can move on to mature discipleship, this second phase where we are in the struggle to give our lives away. Have you ever noticed that when you have those rhythms down, that we're not bogged down by this gross sin in your life? I mean gross in sort of quantity, not like, ooh, yucky gross. But this quantity of sin in your life, that you are more freed up to give your life away. That that command where Jesus says that you are to love your neighbor as yourself, that you are more freed up to do that when you have your life relatively together. Now, of course, you and I both know that we kind of go back and forth between essential and mature discipleship. That sometimes it just feels like we are constantly trying to get our lives together. But as we do so, more and more, we are freed up to give our lives away. But Rollheiser doesn't stop there. He says there's actually this third phase called radical discipleship, where we are in the struggle to give our deaths away. That we might be so ready to go and be with the Lord, and so resolute that that is what will happen when we die from this earth that we die in such a way that points towards the promises we have, been, we have been living into our whole lives. That is what we see in the life of Jacob. He's saying, I am about to die, and I want you. I want to make my whole death, my funeral arrangements, where I'm buried. I want to make it all about my boys my, that will become tribes of Israel. I want to put a stake in the ground and say, I believe so deeply in that, that I want my death to continue to point towards the future of God's good promises. Isn't that the way we all would love to die? Dying in such a way, you've gotten your life together, you've given your whole life away, so that you are ready simply to give your death away and point towards the promises of God. There are many examples, but we are seeing this in real time in Jacob. He wants to keep the promises of God right in front of his son's eyes. He's saying, when I die, they're not done. God still has work to do in you and through you in your generation and the next generation and the generation of after that. God's history will go on long after we are gone. In many ways, the way that Jacob dies is not an ending, but a beginning. And he's saying that land that God promised to our ancestors, he will deliver on. And so I want to be buried with my ancestors in that promised land. And so right out of the gates, we see a future-oriented death. But second, we see a gracious adoption. We'll pick up in chapter 48, verses 3. It says this, 
It says, Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and there he blessed me and said to me, I am going to make you fruitful and increase in numbers. I am, will make you a community of peoples, and I will give you this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. You can see already this continuation of this future-oriented death. He's calling back on the promises of God to him to be blessed, to have a people that will extend, you know, the stars and the sky and the sand on the earth will be kind of the way that you would measure the quantity of his great lineage and that he would have this land. And he's careful to say um, that it was back in the lane of Canaan. That is where they will uh, inherit the promises of God. And it's an important note to remember that they're having this conversation not in the promised land. They're having this conversation in Egypt. So there's this constant pointing towards the future. I think the reason why they did that is sometimes there are places that we aren't supposed to be (laughs) or that we need to leave that have been good to us. You've got to remember who Jacob is talking to. Jacob is talking to Joseph in Egypt. Has Egypt been good to Joseph? Absolutely. He was brought there as a slave, but has risen to the chief person in power. And as Jacob dies, he says, maybe without saying it, it is going to be so tempting for you to stay here in this land where you're the guy in charge. You already have the power. You've got to remember the promised land was one that they were going to have to take over through conquest. It wasn't just going to be handed over. Of course, God would get them there. God would make good on their promises, but it was going to be some effort. And so as Jacob is talking to his son Joseph, he's saying, hey, it might be tempting to stay here in Egypt, but you are going to have to go somewhere else to take up the promises of God. And how he does that and how he continues the story is amazing because now we see a gracious adoption in verse 5. It says, now then, your two sons born to you in Egypt before I came to you here will be reckoned as mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine just as Reuben and Simon are mine. Now, I gotta, this is huge. This is one of those verses I think that you can read by and it sounds like interesting and Bible-y. This is maybe one of my most favorite verses in the Bible because of what it says in this moment and what it says about our life in Christ. See, what Jacob does is he shifts from memory, looking back, to hope in the future. And how does he do it? He says... This is Jacob. Jacob says to his son, Joseph, I'm going to adopt your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and reckon them as mine. So it's kind of an interesting thing going on, right? So a grandparent is adopting grandchildren as his. It's not that he didn't trust Joseph as being a good dad. I think he had all the trust in the world of him. He wanted to adopt them so that they would have the rights of being a son of Jacob. Now, if we've learned anything in the book of Genesis, we have become familiar with being a son was a big deal, mostly because of how it structured the inheritance rights you would have later on when your parent died. See, we, you remember, even for Jacob, this was a big deal, the guy making this promise. Jacob, remember what he did? He was twins, but he was the younger one, and what did he do? He vied for the older position, and he stole the blessing and the birthright so that he would have not just an inheritance, but the double portion. If anyone knew that it was important to be a son of the father, it was Jacob. And here in this moment, as he adopts two sons of Joseph's, he is elevating Joseph to the position of the first son because he is giving his lineage a double portion. It's this incredible reversal again where Jacob was the one who stole the blessing from his father and got the double portion. And here, Jacob is freely giving two portions by adopting his two grandkids, Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, why am I making such a fuss about this? Is because in this moment, they get the status and rank and inheritance of their dad. And the same thing happens to you and I in Christ. See, God the Father had a son to which was his eldest son, his only son, that was set to inherit everything. 
And what the Bible says is as Christians in Christ, we are adopted into the family of Christ. There's actually verses that refer to Jesus as our elder brother. And as brothers with Jesus, what the Bible says is we become co-heirs with Christ. It's one of those things that you might get true, on, you know, factually right on a Bible test, but sometimes fails to sink in. What that means is that we have the rank and the status of King Jesus in all eternity. It's one of those sentences that I can say and it doesn't feel like it could possibly be true because it's so good. That we are heirs to the kingdom of heaven on par with Jesus. We're seeing that happen way back in the Old Testament, way back in the book of Genesis, before you'd think that we would probably encounter the gospel. God is doing something profound. And to explain it best, I came across, I stumbled across this commentary written by a guy born in the early 1800s, and he wrote a commentary on Genesis in 1882. His name's Marcus Dodds. He's a Scottish pastor. I don't know how I found it. It just happens to me sometimes. But I want to read you a section of his commentary where he brings out the meaning of what's happening. Remember, Jacob adopting two of the sons of his son, Joseph. Dodds writes this. He says, No greater honor could have been put on Joseph than this, that his sons should be raised to the rank of heads of tribes on a level with the immediate sons of Jacob. And no higher honor could have been put on the two lads themselves than that they should thus be treated as if they were their father, Joseph, as if they had his worth and his rank. He is merged in them, and all that he has earned, which of your Joseph was a lot, and all that he has earned throughout the history to be found not in his own name, but in theirs, and all that proceeds from him, but his enjoyment is now found in their enjoyment, and his worth acknowledged in their fruitfulness." Do you see what he's saying? He is saying that those sons gained the status of their father who rose to the first seat of power in Egypt. He had a lot to give away and it became his grandkids in a moment when he adopted them as sons. And Dodds knows that this is what happens in Christ. He goes on. He says, thus did God familiarize the Jewish mind through its whole history with the idea of adoption of an adoption of a peculiar kind, of an adoption where already there was an heir who by this adoption has his name and worth merged into the persons now received into his place. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying years ago, God in his sovereignty and providential control of the universe works in this idea of adoption that people would get familiar of it, familiar with it. So they would know, hey, all that is my dad's will one day be mine. When I have adopted, all that is the father's will one day be the son's. And in Christ, this idea of adoption is floating out there all throughout history. And so that one day, 2,000, 3,000 years later from this moment, there will be a man named Jesus walking around and saying, you can be adopted into the family of God. And all that is mine, which by the way is everything, will be yours too. And so no one, if they knew their Bible, would be utterly shocked that this could happen. Dodds goes on. He says, Ephraim and Manasseh were not received alongside Joseph, but each received what Joseph himself might have had. And Joseph's name as a tribe was henceforth only found in these two. This idea was fixed in such a way that for centuries it was steeping in the minds of men so that they might not be astonished if God should in some other case, let's say the case of his own son, adopt men and women into the rank he held and let his estimate of the worth of his son and the honor he puts upon his son be seen in those he adopts. This being so, we plead for nothing more than that God would act with us here as he did act with those two. That he would make us his direct heirs, make us his own sons and daughters, and give us what he who presents us to him to receive his blessing did earn and merits at the Father's hand. Way back when, in chapter 48 of the first book of the Bible, we see the idea of adoption. So that when Christ comes on the scene and offers for those who follow him in faith 
to be adopted into the family of God, to have his rank, his status, his inheritance, that we would be familiarized with that idea so that it wouldn't seem so unthinkable. The providence of God in disclosing the gospel to his people is woven all the way through back to the book of Genesis. The gospel wasn't just a new idea in the New Testament. He was laying the groundwork years ago. John, as he thought about this in the New Testament, would write, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. So as Jacob is closing up this chapter of his existence, he is looking towards the future, even in his death. He is adopting sons into his family so that they have the rank and worth and status and rights of a natural born son. But lastly, we see that he does these blessings in a crisscrossed way. Chapter 48, verses 12 and 13 read, Then Joseph removed from, uh, them from Israel's knees and bowed down with his face to the ground. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim on his right side toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh on his left toward Israel's right hand, and brought them close to him. So you see what he's saying. Jacob is bringing those boy, or, uh, Joseph is bringing those boys up to his father, Jacob. And he lines them up. The oldest in line with Jacob's right hand, which was the hand of blessing, and the younger lined up with uh, Jacob's left hand which was still a hand of blessing, but the hand of lesser blessing. And what happened? See, Joseph had made up in his mind what should happen, but what happened? Verse 14, but Israel reached out his right hand and put it on Ephraim's head, though he was younger, and crossing his arms, he put his left hand on Manasseh's head, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. He crisscrossed the blessing. Stay with me. It says, then he blessed Joseph and said, may the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked faithfully, the God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, may he bless these boys. He goes on. He says, may they be called by my name and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they increase greatly on the earth. And this blessing, as he's blessing these boys, as he's blessing his son, he points to God the Father. Again, he's has this, this radical act of faithful memory. He's saying, God has been with me. He's been the God of my fathers, walking with them faithfully. He's been a shepherd who led them in the right direction and had this loving personal care. And he was the angel who delivered him. Of course, on Jacob's mind has to be his encounters with angels. When he was fleeing his brother Esau, you might remember, he laid down, had a dream of angels going to and from the earth back to heaven on that ladder. And when he returned after 20 years, he was met by a group of angels saying, Esau is on his way to meet you, but we will protect you. As Jacob is doling out these blessings in this crisscrossed way, he is always pointing to God. And again, this sounds like an interesting scene. Oh, neat, he crisscrossed the blessing. But did you know that this is the moment by which the entire life of Jacob would be remembered in one of the most important chapters in the Bible on faith? In Hebrews 11, it's kind of this hall of fame of faithful people. It doesn't mention everybody, and it doesn't mention a lot about any one person. But it mentions this scene right here as the defining moment of the faithful life of Jacob. This is what it says in Hebrews 11:21. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff commentators are baffled. If you went to go read about Hebrews, they'd say, why in the world? All of chapter 49 is Jacob blessing his 12 sons. But when Hebrews goes to remember this man, when it goes to say this important moment of the faithful life of Jacob, the only thing it mentions is this scene in which Jacob adopts two of his grandkids and blesses them as sons. Now why in the world would that be marked as the pinnacle of Jacob's faith. It is because in this moment, we are seeing Jacob faithfully trust God to do things not in the way he expected. This scene goes on, and then we'll break it down even further. It says, when Joseph saw his father placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, he was displeased. 
So he took hold of his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head back to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said, no, my father, this is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. At this time, you have to remember, Jacob's eyesight was failing. Maybe his wits were even failing more. And so Joseph says, oh, no, 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 father, you got it all wrong. So he grabs the hand of the father to try to adjust how he's being blessed. And what does Jacob say? It says, but his father refused and said, I know my son, I know. But he too will become a people and he too will become great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he. His descendants will become a group of nations. As Joseph tries to pry the blessing hand from his younger son to his older son, Jacob says, don't worry about it. Your older son will be blessed. He too will be a people, but this is how I want to give out my blessings. And the scene ends with this. He says, he blessed them that day, and your name will Israel pronounce this blessing. May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. So he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. In this picture, we see trust lived out in action. We see one man who's getting this radical blessing of having his kids moved up, elevated to the status of sons of his father. This is an incredible moment, but he has a picture of how he wants it done. So he lines up the son. He wants to have the greater blessing up with Jacob's right hand. He lines up the other son who's still going to be blessed, but in a lesser way up with the left hand. And Jacob crisscrosses the blessing to go in line with the surprising way God often blesses us. See, he had his mind made up, but the father refused. Again, we're going to give a nod back to 1882 and our friend Marcus Dodds. He helps bring out the meaning of this scene. He says this. He says, we meet these crossed hands of blessing frequently in Scripture. The younger son blessed above the elder, as was needful, lest grace should become confounded with nature. And the belief gradually grow up in men's minds that natural effects could never be overcome by grace, and that in every respect, grace waited upon nature. It's some flowery old language, but here's what he's saying. Every once in a while, God flips the script to remind you he's there and he's in charge. You have your plans of what you want to be blessed and you line it up with the right side of God. And he says, I'm going to bless you in a different way. Dodds goes on. He says, in these crossed hands, we still meet. For how often does God quite reverse our order and bless most about which we had less concern and seem to put a slight on that which has engrossed our best affection? Again and again, for years together, we put forward some cherished desire to God's right hand and are displeased like Joseph that still the hand of greater blessing should pass to some other thing. Does God not know what is oldest with us, what has been longest in our hearts, and what is dearest to us? Certainly, he does know. We read it there. I know it, my son. I know it. He answers all our expostulations. I'm not even sure what that word means, but Dodd said it. So I repeated it. It's not because, there's one more big one. It's not because he does not understand or regard your predilections or your preferences. Your natural excusable preferences that he sometimes refuses to gratis, gratify your whole desire. And he pours upon you blessing of a kind somewhat different than you most earnestly want. He will give you the whole that Christ hath merited. But for the application and distribution of that grace and blessing, you must be content to trust him. Why is this scene so incredible? It's because it shows the radical faith of these people to be blessed, not how they expected, but how God wanted to bless them. It's not that God doesn't know what they wanted. It's that God knew better what they needed. Have you ever done this? Have you ever lined up what you wanted to be blessed at God's right hand? And he goes, yoink. I imagine that's the noise it makes when he does it. Right? <laughs> that happened to me. When I was five years old, you know, the first thing I wanted to be, I declared this, I wanted to be a rich doctor. First, I just wanted to be rich. I watched Scrooge McDuck a lot. He had like the, the money bin he swam in. I thought that would be cool. I didn't know how he made the coins like in there. I thought it might be harder than that, but I just went with it. And then I thought, you know, a great way to do that would be a doctor. And so my whole life was lived in that direction. And I chose my college based on that. I went to Johns Hopkins thinking, isn't that a fancy place, college, that people go to be doctors. And I became a youth pastor, not to become a youth pastor. I became a youth pastor to kill time before med school. 
my advisor said, you should take a year off and catch your breath and get ready for this big long haul. And I said, oh, okay. And they said, you should do medical research. And I was like, well, I don't really like that. Uh, I injected mice as a freshman and I didn't think it was a fun deal. So I was like, but I like people, so I'll go be a youth pastor. That's kind of like clinical research, right? And they were like, you know, frowned at me and were like, okay. And I was going to do it for just one year. And this was the best way I was going to get ready. And so right at the right hand of the Father, I put my fancy education at Johns Hopkins. I put my graduating near the top of my class. I put my great medical school entrance exam scores. I put my letters of recommendation. And I said, I'm just going to do this for one year, and I'm going to be a physician. And God went, I'm still going to bless you. We're going to bless you differently. And so then I stuck it out, and I stayed in ministry, and I moved to California with my wife to go in seminary. And as we neared the end of that, I was calling everybody I knew to get a job. And I couldn't get a job to save my life. And then I was like, well, honey, we got to do something. And she makes one phone call one afternoon and gets a job back in Pittsburgh. She's the most employable, lovely woman you'd ever meet. <laughs> and so I'm at home, and I'm taking care of my daughter, and it's a great year. But I just invested more money and more time to be trained to be a pastor. And I'm sitting at home with my daughter, again, which was great. But I was focused on getting a job. And then no matter who I called, no matter what I said, I couldn't get a job to save my life. And then one day, on a walk around my mom's neighborhood, she runs into Mark Bolton. <laughs> and she gives him my resume, which was probably like, he's perfect and he walks on water. And he's like, oh, that sounds great, you know. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, I'm going to figure this out. And I'm going to pound the pavement. And I'm going to write letters. And I'm going to make phone calls. And my mom gets me my job. <laughs> and for a while, when I was here, I thought to myself, sure hope this works out. I'll make it a year, maybe two, and then I'll get where God really wants me to be. And let me tell you, I have been and am in the right place. I put what I thought was the way that I wanted blessed in front of God's right hand, and he crisscrossed me. And there were times that I felt like I couldn't get out of bed, and there were times that I'm staring at my ceiling saying, What's, is God even really there? And all the while, God was building up my ability to trust him to bless me the way that he knew I needed blessed. It wasn't that he didn't know what I wanted. It's that he knew better what I needed. This might be your life. This might be your career. You plunked it down in front of the right hand of God, and God goes, I'm going to bless you in a different way. This may be your marriage. When you got married, how you got married. Maybe you had a marriage end, and God is saying, I'm going to bless you differently. Maybe this is how your family plans. Maybe you had people in your family not show up. You're struggling to have kids. Maybe you've had people in your family die too early. And God is saying, I want you to trust me because I will still bless you, but I'm going to do it in a different way, in this crisscrossed way. Maybe it's your financial plans. Maybe you thought you'd be making more or saving more, that you could maybe retire before you're 87, right? <laughs> and God is saying, I'm still going to bless you, but I'm going to bless you in a different way. Maybe it's even just a sin in your life. You're saying, dude, I know the way that I covet or I know the way that I get angry or the, the way that I envy what others have or I have this bent towards not telling the full truth. I want to put this down in the front of the blessing of God, this right hand of God is saying, I will bless you. I'll get you through that. But I'm going to do it in a way that is unexpected. Time and time again, we see God acting in this surprising, crisscrossed way to bless people, not how they necessarily want to be blessed, but how they need to be blessed. And it all leans in to God being trustworthy. Can you trust God when what you put down at his right hand is passed over and blessed still, but blessed in a different way? This is not a way of shining up tragedy. This is a way of leaning into God and trusting that he is always in control, even when it doesn't seem like it. Chapter 48 of the book of Genesis captured my imagination this week. Because I saw so much of what it looks like to follow Jesus in these ancient words. That when you make your life's plans, they turn out sometimes differently, but God's still in it. That even when you go to die, there's something to hope for in the future. And that in Christ, we have been adopted into the family of God. So I'm going to have to skip the rest of the verses, but that's okay. Uh, th there's one that uh, I, I may go to. 
But as we end in the book of Genesis, all of chapter 49 is God blessing his sons in this crisscrossed way. And he does so, what the Bible says in Genesis 49, 28. Well, we'll actually use that one. He says, all of these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is what their father said to them when he blessed them, giving each the blessing appropriate to him. Joseph, I'm sorry, Jacob was hand-selecting blessings appropriate for their kids. Some of the best parenting advice I ever got was not treat your kids exactly the same, is treat them exactly differently, how they need to be treated. And we see this father saying, I'm going to bless you exactly how you need to be blessed. And as the book of Genesis ends up, we have the death of Jacob where he is buried in the promised land. We have the death of Joseph, and he too says, don't bury me here. You will be persecuted in Egypt, and there will be an exile out to the promised land, and save my bones and carry me there because I am, promise, I am banking on the promises of God. So in these last couple chapters of the book of Genesis, we have seen a future reign of death. We have seen a gracious adoption. And we have seen this crisscrossed blessing. And you know where else we see them? Surprise, surprise, in the life of Jesus. When Jesus is headed, headed toward his death, time and time again, he says, I am going into the Father's house, but I will come back and take you there with me. He has always pointed to the future, even in his death. He even says, it's good that I go away. Because I will send another comforter, the Holy Spirit, to be with you and empower you and lead you towards all truth. In Christ, we see this gracious adoption that we're put on the same tier with our elder brother, Jesus, inheriting what is his. And finally, we see this crisscrossed blessing, God's way of blessing the world. Do you think the Messiah, the King of all kings, it was in people's mind's eye that he would die on a cross to win the salvation of the world? It was unthinkable. But God said, I'm going to bless all humanity differently. But you've got to trust me. We see all of this in Jesus. This is not just the end of the book of Genesis. This is a beginning. This is the gospel. We see it written all throughout every page of scripture. Thanks be to God that we can have future reign of deaths, that we can be graciously adopted, and we can accept and trust God's crisscross blessing. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, you are so good. You give us your word. You extend yourself to us. You want us to be in relationship with you. All throughout history, you have reached out to humanity, showing yourself to us. God, we ask that we would embrace how you have revealed yourself, that we take you as you give us yourself, that we don't second guess it, that we don't not trust it, that we lean in and say, you are good, you can be trusted. And even when you cross your hands and bless us differently, it's not because you don't know, it's because you know better. Help us increasingly become people of trust in Jesus. We ask that in his name. Amen.